I didn't check on the technical okay. stuff. I see in the chat there's a direct message to me from the Beth, from the Beth Sedek congregation saying, "Are we okay to get started?" <laughs> okay. I don't know if okay. So I, I can just start with an intro. Yeah. <laughs> We're okay. All right. I mean, I, I could just thank everyone for uh, taking the time to join us this evening. Sure. On behalf of Beth Sedek, and uh, let's uh, let's get right to it. Okay. So on behalf of the, my name is Sandra Lipton. I'm president of the Jewish Historical Society of Southern Alberta. And on behalf of the Jewish Historical Society, I want to express our appreciation to Beth Sedek, to the Hazak Group for partnering with us in the presentation of tonight's program. Uh, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Harry, Harry the historian who does have a last name, Harry Sanders. <laughs> and he's been a historian almost since birth, born in Drumheller, um, but raised in Calgary. Uh, it is his passion to collect and share the fascinating stories of life in Calgary and Alberta. He not only preserves and promotes history uh, through, his, through, through his work as a freelance historical consultant, uh, but has also served as an active volunteer for various historical societies. And currently he is a board member and a longstanding valuable one uh, of the Jewish Historical Society of Southern Alberta and co-editor of the Historical Society of Alberta's journal, Alberta History. Harry has published in several magazines and is the author of over seven books on local history. In 2012, he was appointed as the first historian laureate for the Calgary Heritage Authority. A popular public speaker with fascinating stories, and I had the privilege of hearing him talk in part one of his presentation of uh, Reinach? Reinach. 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 <laughs> I wasn't listening too well to the pronunciation, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you will find his continuing presentation tonight on this uh, street and the Jewish presence on this street most enjoyable. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us. Harry. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sandra. Uh, I have to share one quick anecdote, though. I was at Hebrew school when Sandra's father was the principal, uh, Harry Sherman but I didn't know the relationship. And then once at a board meeting of the Historical Society, you mentioned, Sandra mentioned something about her father having been Harry Sherman. And I said, your father was Harry Sherman? And Sandra looked at me and she said, what kind of an historian are you? <laughs> so I, I know, uh, I know um, my own uh, limitations. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you very much, uh, Lauren and Sandra. I'm gonna share my screen. Whoops, no, that's not what I need to do. Um, I'll minimize, there we go. No, but that doesn't work either. Lauren, do you know what I should do? Wow. What are you trying to do? Well, I want to share. I have You're not allowed to share. Okay, hold on. Maybe uh, you don't have rights to share. Got to be a no. co-host to share. It worked last. Or I just made you a co-host, so now it should. Just oh, give it a okay. try again. Sure. All right. Uh, now I got to find the the Zoom again. Uh, if too many too many. Oh wait, it's minimized somehow. There we go. Okay, share screen. Um, open my presentation hold on a second sorry to take everyone's time for this do you guys see that yep oh yeah. good. perfect it worked just right Oh, I forgot to take off the uh, historic Calgary week. Uh, also, if I think if if people um, have comments uh, in the chat or, you know, I mean, I think there's few enough of us and I have a realistic uh, amount of material to get through. I think we're on till 830, aren't we, Lauren or, and Sandra? Um, or as long as people want to stay, you know, if, if anyone drops out before it's finished, I yeah. won't be insulted. I can't, I can't even see most of you. Uh, and uh, anyway, what I tried to do is ram through uh, six blocks of Fourth Avenue in the previous version of this. I've got a little more research completed um, and I'm only going to do three blocks here, three blocks tonight and three blocks on a date in January that's already been chosen. 
um, for the second part. So there's uh, there's time there's time to to not speak quickly, and time I think for anyone to add what they know um, either through the chat or or just by commenting. And what I'd like to do is make quick notes um, as we're as we're talking. If someone's got something to add, and Mel, I saw that you joined and. Um, uh, you see, I didn't get a chance to transcribe the uh, the stuff from the chat in the previous version. So some of the some of the new material that's been offered to me hasn't made it into this version of it. So if if you were at, in the previous talk and and uh, and see that you think you wasted your time with me, you didn't. But please please uh, speak up and repeat it. Um, and, and now the thing about uh, Fourth Avenue being Calgary's forgotten Jewish street, it's. I've done, it's just a, a little, you know, it, it, it's a parlor game here. Uh, it's a coincidence that the street that had an, that was named for a Jewish man um, had a lot of Jews in it, uh, living on it. Um, when Calgary was first um, subdivided in 1880, uh, the, the plan was subdivided in 1883. It was registered and marketed in 1884. This is downtown Calgary which uh, the Canadian Pacific Railway owned through its real estate subsidiary, the Canada Northwest Land Company. And um, they named, this is uh, from 6th, 6th Street Southeast to 14th Avenue, sorry, 14th Street Southwest, uh, from the Bow River in the north, south to 17th Avenue. That's the land that the CPR owned. It's section 15, township 24, range one west of the 5th Meridian south of the Bow River. And that was the original town site of Calgary, which was later that year incorporated as the town of Calgary. So the town site was just the, the land that the CPR owned and subdivided and marketed. Um, and, uh, and the town is the um, corporate body that you know, is, exists within those boundaries. Uh, the CPR named the streets and avenues for executive officers of the railway company or the real estate subsidiary. So, um, you know, we know some of those names. Uh, Stephen Avenue, it was named for Baron George Mount Stephen, who was the president of the company. You know, there was Van Horde Avenue, um, all these names that are familiar to us from, from CPR history and, and others that we don't quite remember. McTavish Street, McIntyre Avenue, um, Angus Avenue. Um, they, 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 all these names were removed in 1904 um, and two of them have been restored. We're back to Stephen Avenue since the uh, um, uh, 1980s is when the 8th Avenue Mall was renamed the Stephen Avenue Mall. Um, and Barclay Street has come back. That's 3rd Street Southwest. Um, you know, but these people, they're, they're, it's, they're named because they were executive officers of the company, as was Rainick. Um, that was uh, Baron uh, Jacob Adolf Rainick. He was a uh, German Jew who relocated to France uh, was given a, this title and uh, he was a banker, very successful banker. Um, he was an investor in the CPR. So that's how he got his name on this. This is like Bassano, Alberta. There was an there was a, um, Italian nobleman named Bassano who got his name. Uh, same thing with Lethbridge. William Lethbridge never set foot in Lethbridge. Uh, he, was, uh, he was an officer with the W.H. Smith bookseller company in London, and he invested in the CPR, so they named a, a city for him. Uh, so Rainick had no special connection to Calgary. Uh, he was Jewish, uh, and uh, so that's, you know, that, that is of special interest to us. Um, the one thing about Rainick, he was involved in a massive scandal involving uh, financing of a proposed Panama Canal in the late 19th century, um, and this was hugely embarrassing to the French government. Rainick killed himself. Um, so uh, he, and he, I think uh, by that time, Rainick Avenue had already been renamed, or no, it hadn't. It was still Rainick Avenue when, when he died, but it was renamed Fourth Avenue in 1904. I've got one Jew connected to uh, Rainick Avenue from the time it was Rainick Avenue, a guy named Geffen. Um, anyway, that's the background to the name. Now, the thing is, there were lots of Jews living in the east end of, of uh, Calgary, not strictly on 4th Avenue. So I've just isolated those on 4th Avenue because of the name, because of the coincidence that many Jews lived on a street that had once been named for a Jewish man. But if you go around the corner or the next block over, you'll see many Jews also. And the Jews kind of drop off after about 1st Street Southwest. 
Um, it was a pretty nice district uh, from, I think, about First Street Southeast westward on Fourth Avenue, uh, less so in the East End, uh, you know, smaller houses and uh, Jews were poor immigrants when they came. So this was, uh, um, the East End was an area where, where you settled if you uh, hadn't yet become established or, or hadn't already become established. Uh, so I'll get to the first block that I want to talk about. Oh, here's a photograph of Rainick Avenue. I don't know the exact location of it. And here's the first Jewish, first reference we've got to a Jewish person. This is from Gronlund's Directory, 1902. Elijah E. Geffen, uh, H, meaning home, Rainick East, North Side. So I'm I'm quite sure that going through the um, the assessment rolls, I'm going to be able to locate the, his exact lo his exact address. But he was on the north side of Fourth Avenue. Um, Elijah Geffen, a junk dealer um, who had a clothing store on Eighth Avenue East by 1910. So he moved up from junk to uh, to clothing. Um, he ended up declaring bankruptcy in 1924, and the family relocated to California. So hopefully by the next time, I'm going to know where uh, Elijah Geffen lived. We're at here a, a block. This is the further, the block furthest east, east of Fourth Street. So you can see the Langevin Bridge, bridge to the right-hand side of the screen. This is from a fire insurance map in 1911. That's of course now the uh, Reconciliation Bridge. Langevin's name has been removed because of his his um, involvement with the establish and defense by the government of the uh, of the um, indigenous residential schools in the 19th century. Um, anyway, this block more or less doesn't exist anymore. It's it's sort of been been changed over by street changes and uh, and gentrification in the in the East Village. Uh, but we see a few Jewish parties here, 500 East Block of Fourth Avenue. Um, and once again, some of these people I know nothing other than a name. So I've got um, A. Rosenthal. I've highlighted the, um, the 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 property. A. Rosenthal, a tenant. I learned from. Um, uh, from from the assessment rolls. So I don't know what he did or what he did there. It's probably his residence. And on the south side, the, the, the south half of the block, Louis Goldstein is the tenant over there. So some of these entries, I'm afraid, are going to be about as exciting as that. Uh, but uh, but this, is, this is the nature of the research. Um, uh, the, at the corner of 4th, 4th Avenue and 4th Street East, we have Mrs. Go Rosa Goldstein living there. Um, she doesn't share the name with Mr. Wolf, uh, but you, you, who knows what, uh, what these, um, you know, if there's multiple dwellings in these houses, who knows? Anyway, M. Wolf, uh, you know, uh, I think to be Jewish, he appears as M. Wolf in the tax roll and Martin Wolf, um, uh, a tinsmith in Henderson's directories. I take him to be the same person and that he's Jewish. Uh, and uh, as for Wolf versus Wolf, um, you know, I mean, I just take that it, it, someone perceived that the man was Jewish. Um, oh, and uh, Louis Goldstein, that that uh, 404, that uh, corner house there, it's uh, Louis Goldstein's um, secondhand store um, after that date. He later on had a pool room um, on, uh, on 4th Street East, a couple of blocks to the south. Uh, and you can see uh, how, how some of these things are recorded. A lot of these data are coming from Henderson's directory. So you see here Italians in 1910. Sometimes you see Italians, Hungarians, or s Chinese, or simply foreigners. And it just evokes, like you can imagine, the, the field agent of the Henderson directory company standing at the door talking to somebody, you know, and recording what they, what they learn. Uh, and if they can't learn anything, then they, they record that. Um, I've got uh, some of these notes don't relate to to properties that involve Jewish people, so I'm just going to skip past a few of them. There we have another foreigners. Um, here we've crossed the street, and and this will be a repeat for those who saw the program before. But this is the north side of the 400 East Block. The building's still there. It's it was recently, fairly recently, Booker's Crab Shack, um, and uh, it uh, I hadn't known this for many years, but a colleague demonstrated this by comparing uh, the dimensions of the building from aerial photography, um, aerial photographs, that this is the remnant of the Calgary Public Market, which was built in, um, uh, uh, by 1914, it was built about 1913. It was a city owned market. This is actually a competitor to another market that we as a Jewish community uh, have a, have a um, 
inherited memory of uh, uh, with, with more strong association, the city hall market, which was right where Olympic Plaza is right now. And, and uh, I was speaking with Sheila Gervich at the beginning of the program. Her parents were among the many um, vendors at, at that one. This one was, um, it was Kitty Corner to, uh, to the Cecil Hotel. Uh, this one, um, uh, you know, had, had quite a few stalls and uh, it ended up becoming a bit of a white elephant, I understand. And they even talked about turning it into a public swimming pool, but they didn't. Uh, and uh, it was, um, sorry, Laurie Abernathy, you were at, uh, at Heritage Park today, you were saying. So this will be a very familiar scene to you because, uh, just a second, here's what you saw today, Gasoline Alley. Gasoline Alley is patterned after, the exterior of it is patterned after the Calgary Public Market. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there, there, there's the uh, Calgary Farmer's Market is building new venue in Calgary. Here's a construction photo. So they've, they've used that design. So they're building a new market in suburban Calgary that will resemble uh, in the exterior, the original um, Calgary, uh, uh, Calgary Public Market. Now this market was less Jewish than, uh, than, than the one where Olympic Plaza is now, uh, but it ended up being privately owned by Sam Shainan, who, who was Jewish. So it, it, he was a, a poultry vendor at the market for many years and, uh, uh, and he ended up buying the place. And you'll see his name there. Here, here I've got a photograph of Annie Gale and her son. She's the first female um, city councillor in Calgary's history. Also, the, the, the second, the first in Canada, the second only in the British Empire uh, for a woman to be a municipal councillor. Um, and uh, anyway, she was, uh, she was one of the forces behind the establishment of this market. She was, uh, uh, I believe, before she was elected to council, she was part of the Consumers League of Calgary. And they wanted to, um, uh, you know, just kind of empower women by uh, by leveraging food prices down, um, and I think they had some success at that. Uh, anyway, here is what became of that market. It burned, uh, and uh, and and what we know of as the building that housed the crab shack is a remnant of it. But here we have a post-fire photograph with Sam Shannon's uh, name right at the front. Did anyone listening know Sam Shannon? I did not. Uh, everybody might be muted, I think. It seems pretty quiet. Uh, anyway, here's... Didn't, didn't Sam Shannon have a son that, that, that would be... Yeah. <laughs> I remember son. I remember yeah. him. Yeah. Joe, yeah, Joe Shannon was part of our group of friends. And Sam was his father. Yeah. Right. Very good. Well... You'll, you'll see where his house was and, uh, and a photograph of him and his daughter a little later in the talk. Is, is Joe Shannon still around? Uh, that I don't know. Oh, no. Yeah. Anyway, the building is there. Um, and uh, that's where it is. Greenbrier is where they're building this one. Um, now we go to the next block over. Uh, this is, uh, or, or the south side of the block, this is the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, Calgary Drop-In Center, uh, and uh, there were a few Jews. Here's, here's the block earlier on. So the Drop-In Center is on the west side of the block where you see flower and feed in the corner. The Cecil Hotel was at the other end of the block, at the east end of the block, until just a few years ago. And here I've highlighted in blue the, the sites on the block that had a Jewish connection. Uh, this is a more recent uh, fire insurance map showing it in the 1960s, that block, a little more, more built up. Uh, and here that's uh, uh, James E. Love's Flower and Feed, no, no Jewish connection, so I'm just going to skip ahead. Uh, here we have 423, which is in about the middle of the block. Here is another case where I just have a clue uh, that I didn't have before. Um, it's a property, I believe, to have been a residence because, uh, because there's someone is, is, is renting it. But it's Joff Joff the Joffies in <laughs> Drumheller before they moved to Calgary, I believe. And S. Burkhoff, I don't know which Burkhoff that is. I'm um, trying. I remember them. You do. Well, we'll uh, we'll hope to learn a little more about it anyway. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, every little bit helps. It it, it tells us uh, 
um, what Jewish connection there was, you know, uh, how, how widespread Jews were in this part of town. Uh, 421, a stone cutter was, was the original occupant. Um, and then this becomes the home of Benjamin Margulis, a secondhand dealer who uh, uh, lived there 1911 to 1913. The photograph is not on this site. This is the, um, this is the building that had housed the Calgary Opera House built in 1893. Um, it was later converted just into shops and apartments after, the, uh, after Sir James Lougheed built the, um, the Grand Theater, the old Calgary Opera House just couldn't compete and was just turned into a commercial space. And he had a, 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 a shop there became a furniture dealer. Uh, he had a heart attack uh, by the time he owned, oh, that's it, he owned Ben's Confectionery in what had been the opera house. Um, so that's, he lived in the middle of the block. Um, the same address that had been, um, had been uh, 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 Margulis's uh, then becomes the home of Harry Carnett, who was the father of Dr. Morris Carnett, Calgary's first uh, psychiatrist. Um, Carnett had come from the Crescent. On which? Oh, Colborne, yes. Yeah, later on. Yeah, it was a step above 4th, 4th Avenue East, I think. Yeah, uh, 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 comment on his, on his uh, success. Um, foreigners at the same address in 1916. Um, then we get to 415 where Charles Malkin is a tenant in 1907. This I think is the second earliest reference to a Jewish person I have on 4th Avenue Southeast. And the first one after it's changed from Rainick Avenue to 4th Avenue. Charles Malkin had a um, uh, grocery store on 8th Avenue East, right where uh, the, um, uh, I believe it's where the, the convention center is now. It's either the convention center or the Olympic Plaza. I, I, I can't remember which it is. Um, anyway, and he was also the, I believe the first president of the Hever Kedisha. Um, anyway, so he's just, living there uh, on 4th Avenue East um, early on before the First World War. Uh, 415, we've got, once again, I know nothing more than his name, Harry Berkison, and from the name, so much of this, you know, I mean, how do we know people were Jewish? Well, the name is, is a clue, although Harry Sanders is not a clue. Um, anyway, uh, clothing merchant lived there in 1910, and then the same address is Sam Martin of Martin's Bakery, um, hey, is Betty Sherwood on today? Betty's a good source. This is, this is her family. Uh, lived, lived there later on uh, in a newer building constructed in 1941. And then the address becomes the Beerland Liquor Store, which was owned by um, the Cecil Hotel. And there, when we get to the Cecil Hotel, we've got a, a very strong Jewish connection. And we'll be there in just a moment. Uh, 411. Um, oh, there's a, a series of black people living on 411. I mean, always enjoy the, the sort of ethnic mix. We've seen Italians, we're going to see Hungarians. Um, there's uh, Chinese and, uh, and there's a Sikh man on this street here. So here we have a house where there's a black musician, uh, Jack Paris, and later on, uh, um, Cappy Sweeney, uh, who her and her husband, Earl Grayman, lived there uh, in the late, uh, during the Second World War and after the Second World War. Um, a fellow named M. Shorsky, who might be oh, someone named Martin Shorsky, all, this is all I know about him. The name sounds Jewish. I know nothing else, but I know that a man by that name had his car stolen in Calgary in 1922. So once again, you know, uh, I'm not quite at a story. Uh, I hope you'll have the patience to revisit this at some point in the future when it has come together a little bit more. Anyway, this where this Shorsky had lived, here we have Singh Ram living in 1927. So um, uh, was it you, Minnie, or who was it that mentioned uh, Calgary was, uh, was mostly Anglo-Saxon um, when you were younger? Uh, it, and I've, I've seen the statistic, it was 80%. Jews, were, Jews peaked at 2% in the 1921 census and the 1941 census. Wow. Uh, it's all been downhill since 1941. We're nowhere near 2% of the population, but it was 80% Anglo-Saxon at one time. So, you know, I mean, I mean that's the character of the, of the society. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm always, you know, it's, it's always a, a little delight to find, uh, to find some um, uh, ethnic mixture. So Sing Ram sort of, sort of stands out there. Uh, we keep going ahead to 407. 
uh, and who's at 407, a man named David Sloan lived there. But who do we see in the photograph that was supplied by the family? It's Sam Shannon. So this is the house just east of the, um, well, two houses east of the Cecil Hotel. Uh, so it's between, if you remember the Cecil Hotel liquor store and the Cecil Hotel itself, Sam Shannon lived between them. He's photographed here with his daughter, he was born in Russia, uh, lived in Calgary for the last 53 years in his, of his life, and he owned the, um, uh, the, uh, the Calgary, public, uh, Calgary Public Market. Um, then we get to 405, and who's there? This is the, the house right next to the Cecil. And we have Samuel Martin, again, at a, at a new location, um, living above their bakery. Uh, and then they later on, we'll see it, they, uh, they built, purpose built a new brick building a little further west on 4th Avenue, Kitty Corner, actually, um, in 1945. And now we're at the Cecil Hotel. This is a great photograph, uh, archival photograph, showing it when it was new. And so many people um, uh, think of this Cecil Hotel in its later days and uh, and think of it as a blight. You know, I remember when, because, you know, I mean, in, in its final years, there were a lot of visitations from police and, and, uh, and you know, violent episodes and, 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 and drugs. And I remember the YWCA was insistent that the hotel be, be uh, demolished, that it, it just was a bad memory. And I, I can understand why people who have a bad association you know, with something, don't want to see it, and it and it just triggers them. So I do understand that. But the Cecil Hotel, you know, I mean, it was a nice hotel at one time, and even you know, even in in not too the not too distant history, there was some some pride there. You know, there was um, uh, it had its own house orchestra uh, early on in its history, uh, and in the 1960s, it was the um, it was like the after game place for lesbian baseball players in Calgary. They would gather at the Cecil Hotel after their games, and that was their, that was their club. Uh, and uh, it was owned for many years by, um, by uh, Leo, Leo Silverman. And uh, I was introduced to him once uh, when I was in university. Um, uh, a, a good friend of mine, David Krebs, his father is an ophthalmologist, and Dr. Krebs was the ophthalmologist for Leo Silverman. So there was a connection and, and David knew I was interested in the history of hotels. So they introduced me to Leo Silberman and I got to interview him in the bar and uh, I really enjoyed the time talking to him. Anyway, he brought out, he had, he had been a, a, a Holocaust survivor. He was, and he'd been, he'd survived the a concentration camp and he had a certificate from the German government, from the West German government that, uh, you know, certified that he was entitled to, uh, to a pension because of his, uh, uh, what he'd suffered in the Holocaust. Uh, anyway, and he, uh, he, he refused to take the money. He said, they can't pay me for what they did. So, but it was so funny, you know, I mean, I'm so careful with archival documents and here he was with his certificate from the German government, which had been issued decades earlier. And he was rolling it up and tapping it on his leg, you know, like, uh, like it was a document that didn't matter. Uh, anyway, and then I told him, you know, I've got some, some research material on the history of the hotel. Would you like that? And he looked at me and he said, what I need this. Uh, so that sort of entered my lexicon, what I need this. Uh, anyway, and then uh, I know my sister Elias is on the call. And uh, when, uh, when Leo's son Sam took over the hotel, uh, Elias used to rent a parking stall. Uh, and she said it was, it was a great, great landlord, uh, a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so the, the Cecil Hotel had a good, uh, good Jewish connection. It's gone, but you see the house to the right there. And Mel, this is where I want you to come in. Uh, because that house is on 3rd Street Southeast, um, right around the corner from the hotel. I've highlighted it here. Uh, and here I've got a little profile of its occupants, non-Jewish until Alex Corrin sounds Jewish in 1948. But Joe Sales, I know, who had been Joseph uh, uh, Srolovitz. This is um, uh, Max, Srolovitz, Max and Goldie Srolovitz's son my dad's cousin, lived there in the early 50s. He and his dad and their French-Canadian friend, uh, Joe's old war buddy, owned Frenchies, which is now Frenchies and Baratos. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a case of, uh, you know, why is it Smith-built hats? Because who would buy a Shumiatra built hat? You know, you wouldn't go to Srolovitz's, so they called the place Frenchies. But Mel, you said last time that some relative of yours or your own family had lived in that house. Are you here, Mel? I don't know. Anyway, uh, I hope if you're here, you'll you'll put it in the chat now because I think uh, I think everybody's on mute again. 
Um, anyway, we go now to the third block that I'm looking at, and I think we might end up a little early because this is the final block, the two sides that we're going to look at. Here's the north side um, of the 300 east block. There's a, an apartment tower there now called Riverfront Point. It might have a, a Jewish connection because there's a law office on the main floor. Can you hear me, Harry? Oh, yes, I can. Is that Mel? Oh, uh, I, wa I, wasn't seeing, I wasn't seeing my video, so I just turned my, my, um, my uh, mute off. So, oh, okay. yeah, if, yeah, so I can see the, the uh, picture of where I was born. So that was a rooming house. So that was on the corner. I recall watching the Calgary Stampede from the south end of the stoop of that, of that rooming house. My mother held me, and, and uh, the Stampede Parade went by, went on Fifth Avenue, all, all past, past uh, the shul. The shul was just a half a block west of, of that. Uh, the, the house of Jacob was just a half a block west of the uh, rooming house where, where we live. Um, subsequently, through the years, my father wound up buying that rooming house. And uh, it was predominantly Italians. Uh, my, my parents wound up speaking fluent Italian after the war. They lived in Italy for a few years. So they befriended many, many Italians. But uh, uh, my, brother, my brother actually was born in Italy. He was an Italian citizen. Uh, 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 but I was, I was born in the Holy Cross Hospital. And my first few years were spent in that rooming house. Wow. So which, which years did your family own that rooming house? Well, they came to Calgary. They, um, I was born in 49. I believe they came to Calgary in about four, um, 47 or 48. Oh, now they didn't buy that rooming house until about sometime in the 1950s. Hmm. Um, they wound up owning a grocery store on, um, uh, it was called the East End Food Store, right, right beside your grandfather's uh, a junk store, M M M Morris Frulovich. Oh yeah, my great uncle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your great uncle. On one side of uh, his store was uh, Benny Fixler's grocery store. On the other side, it was called Victoria Apartment. Was my father's grocery store, East End Food Store. The uh, uh, the existing Calgary City Hall sits right on top. Sits right on top of that property today. Very good. Yeah. Was your family anyway, that, living, oh, sorry? Uh, that rooming house brings back quite a few memories. My dad used to, my, of course, my dad would walk down every now and then into the Cecil Hotel to have a beer with, I don't know, some of his friends. Um, there were predominantly two doors on the west side of the Cecil Hotel. In those days, women could not go into a bar unescorted. So there was ladies and escort, a sign that said ladies and escorts and men's entrance. Yeah, the, the last <coughs> hotel that still had that sign up, I think that went, by the way, in 1967. But yeah. up until it closed, the, um, the St. Louis Hotel still had that sign on the door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah During that era, good. when um, a lot of Jewish people, including the Silbermans, who were friends of our families, uh, they bought the Cecil Hotel on or about 1971. The Blitz bought the St. Louis Hotel, the St. Louis Hotel. So many Jews in, in the early 70s, including my father, um, uh, started, started going from the grocery stores. Uh, the Silvermans went from grocery stores to hotel. My dad went, uh, he, he, everybody was in a grocery store. The Blitz were in grocery store in uh, Victoria Park. They moved into the hotel business also. A lot of Jewish people moved into the hotel business. This in, must in, sound in, familiar to you, Sheila. Well, the Sheftels were in the hotel business many, many decades before that. The oh. Empress, the Empress yeah. was the first one, right? That's right. The Empress on Seventh Avenue. That's right. Yeah. Sixth Avenue. I think it was Sixth, wasn't it? Next to the next to Harold. It's Hill. Sixth, uh, Sixth yeah. Avenue. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, yeah, typical. Uh, there's a there's a, a letter that we've got. Our my uncle Max Cornbloom was uh, looking. My my Zeta wanted my uh, Zeta Harry wanted to buy a hotel, so we've got a letter from my uncle Max about the Cecil. The Cecil was for sale, so he's writing to my my Zeta about what's so great about the Cecil Hotel, and maybe you should buy that. 
but they didn't. So, it was, when was it that the Silbermans bought it? Sixty-one, did you say? Uh... No, no, no. I don't. I don't believe it was sixty-one. I believe it was more like nineteen seventy-one. Um, oh, okay. I, 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 I was good friends with Sam Silberman. Right. And good friends with Morris Blitz. So the Blitz went into the hotel business, the St. Louis. They also Blitz also bought the King Edward, which was like on Ninth Avenue. The Silbermans. It seems to me. They bought their hotel before my dad bought his hotel. Seems to me that would have been in the very early 70s, maybe even late 60s. Yeah. Very good. You know, I have to tell you something, uh, just since we, we mentioned the, uh, the, the Blitz. Um, uh, Cheryl Fogel, who's a uh, um, historian and playwright in Calgary, she's Black, and she writes about the Black community. And it was such a gratifying thing she said once. She said that... Uh, uh, you know, it brings to mind, I haven't seen it, but I, I know the concept of Green Book. Uh, anyway, she said, Black people just knew that if they went to the uh, St. Louis Hotel, they'd be treated okay. You know, and I'm sure there were other hotels like that too. But you know what I mean? Being Jewish, it's just kind of gratifying to hear somebody say that about a, a fellow Jewish person that, that, that you would know that you wouldn't, you know, that because there were hotels where, where there was a color bar. Uh, in Calgary, um, including the uh, the King Edward, which was right next to where all the you know most of the black people in town lived, and they couldn't enter the King Edward Hotel. Um, among Ralph other Klein's people. favorite hotel, I believe, was the St. Louis Hotel. The uh, the uh, the uh, Blit uh, ladies uh, used to make chicken, and uh, he loved their he loved their home cooked chicken. And apparently, Ralph Klein liked to go there and drink and eat. Popular yeah. watering hole for Ralph Klein. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So near to City Hall. That's right. Conveniently located. Um, Mel, do you have any photographs of that uh, that rooming house that your, your folks owned? Uh, um, the only photograph that I have is my mother holding me as a little baby on 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 uh, the south uh, stairs, the south end, the the south entrance of, of that uh, rooming house. That's about the only picture that I have. It's quite an old picture. It's a value, it's value added. It's old, it's got you and it's got your mother. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you, Mel. That's, that's great. That was, that was really illuminating. So uh, I suppose uh, my dad's cousin, Joe Sales, was a neighbor of your folks in that same rooming house at the time. Uh, everybody was a neighbor in, in uh, yeah. those days. The Martins were a block away. Martin's Bakery was Kitty Corner from the Cecil Hotel. Zeman's Eggs. Zeman's was across the street and from the from the Cecil Hotel, as I recall, and that was owned by the Wainbergs. Is, was, is that on Fourth Avenue? Yes. Oh, I missed it then. I believe like that 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 crab shack before it was a crab shack. I believe that building it was called Z Z Zeman's Eggs. That's rings right. a bell in the days when I was in the rooming house. And uh, the Wainbergs, Ida, and uh, I forget what the, his name was, but they were our neighbor in, in uh, Kelvin Grove. But they owned that, that the egg business, and I believe they occupied that building uh, that was on, uh, uh, that was right beside the Calgary Public Market. Definitely right across the street from Martin's Bakery on, 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 on the east side of, of the, uh, east of Martin's Bakery. Um, I'll tell you another quick story. Uh, so um, uh, uh, my dad and I, we used to, when I was a, uh, uh, we used to walk down to Martin's Bakery to buy challah and buy pumpernickel bread and stuff like that. Uh, old, man, uh, Mar old man Martin's son, Benny Martin, he used to, he used to kibitz with me. Uh, he stuffed me in the oven. Uh, uh, he didn't turn on, but it's one of those uh, convection ovens, you know, where, where, uh, where it uh, rotates the breads for, uh, for proofing it, you know, uh, kind of like an elevator, kind of like an elevator. So, so they'd throw me in there and then rotate me around a couple of times and open up the door and then take me out. Wow. I wasn't baked, but I was pretty scared. <laughs> Good story. We got wonderful bagel every Sunday at Martin's Bakery. Oh, yeah, you he ate the them up before you got home. Yeah, yeah, he was the best. <laughs> That's great. But Zeman was an egg man. Zeman, so it was definitely... Um, Mr. Zeman, I think Wayneberg was a brother-in-law. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, to Jack Smolensky. His wife was, he was a oh. brother to Jack Smolensky. Oh, okay. Wayman, Wa the, the, sorry, who, who was a relative of Jack Smolensky? Sorry? Uh, you, someone mentioned so-and-so was a relative of Jack Smolensky. I missed who it was. Uh, was that Ida Wayneberg? Yes, okay. it was. Exactly. Uh -huh. Ida, yeah. 
Oh, okay. exactly. It'll it'll be in the next edition of this talk, which will be okay. so much better that you guys will want to attend. Okay. Uh, Anyway, here we are at the, uh, the uh, east end of the 300 block on the north side. The Martin family, again, the, the bakery family, had built the Martin building by the late 1950s, just a, a, a commercial building. Um, and then uh, um, next to that, I've got Samuel Shane. This is probably Samuel Shane. Shane and I think I'm being a little obsessive here about which Jews lived where and when. Uh, anyway, don't need to, to be too, too particular about that. Um, but uh, we just make our way west along the north side. We've got Michal Siegel, a horse dealer in 1917. I do have better stories, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll be sure and get to them. Uh, here we have 332, Samuel Elman um, at the address 1921 to 1922. Um, now, I've got someone by the same name, Samuel Elman, in the divorce column in the Herald in 1930. So probably scandalous, I can read it to you. Uh, a number of, of, and I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's sad. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an unhappy situation they're describing here. Um, uh, and these, these, are, these are before uh, Mr. Justice Walsh, who was William Walsh, he became, he was the hanging judge in Calgary. He was the judge who hanged uh, Piccarello and Lissandro. Um, uh, uh, Florence Lissandro was the inspiration for, um, for the Calgary Opera production, Philomena. Um, anyway, he he hanged. He was condemned her to death. The last um, woman hanged in Alberta. Uh, anyway, here he is in divorce court, sitting on the application of Samuel Elman, who obtained a degree a divorce absolute from his wife Mary Elman, both of Calgary. The wife in this case had sued the husband for divorce, and the husband counterclaimed against the wife for divorce. The trial judge found the statutory grounds proven against both parties, but granted the divorce to the defendant husband. There was one child born of this marriage on which the parties came to an agreement. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The next paragraph was the part that uh, uh, <laughs> I don't have it there. Sorry about that. Anyway, it just was saying about how they were they were arguing in the courthouse. Um, uh, anyway, we just keep going. In, in so many cases, there are just names but I've got a couple of good stories. Here we've got, uh, a, a, in some cases, I'm able to show you what the place looks like now. And to be honest, this doesn't look like much of an improvement over anything that might've been there before. It's the middle of the block and it's just a parking lot. This is where uh, Hirsch Sosinski lived. This is an ancestor of our, our uh, Historical Society's past president, um, uh, uh, Betty Sherwood. Uh, he came uh, from Russia, worked in uh, Owen Sound, Ontario for the Jewish community before coming to Calgary in 1905. He answered an ad to work as a shochet, uh, a butcher, and as a cantor. Um, and he was basically the rabbi before we had a rabbi. He uh, uh, was also the mohel and he officiated at weddings. Um, and, uh, but it didn't pay all that well and he ended up going into business for himself. Um, he uh, married Etta Sayer of uh, Hirsch Colony at Oxbow. Uh, so he resigned and established the Calgary Grocery. Uh, and they're standing in front of the Calgary Grocery, looking east toward, um, toward the Cecil Hotel that you see over to the right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and he operated until he died at this address, until he died in 1957. Betty Sherwood supplied the photograph. Here's Ruth Sherwood standing in front of the store, looking east on 4th uh, on Avenue mm -hmm. again east from the 300 east block. Uh, 322 next door, we have Morris Martin living there. Uh, and I always remember, I can't remember his daughter's name, but she gave the Historical Society the certificate that her father received in 1955 from the Manning government, the Ernest Manning government, for everyone who had lived in Alberta prior to 1905 and honored them with a, a jubilee, uh, a golden jubilee certificate. And his said, Hebrew Morris Martin, as though that was his name, Hebrew Morris Martin. Uh, anyway, uh, he lived on that block uh, and he moved to Blackie in 1917 to run a store, another at Iracana, and then returned to Calgary. Um, here is, mentions his, uh, his Hebrew Morris Martin, Martin certificate signed by Premier, Premier Ernest Manning. Uh, the same house, you later have Isaac Chur Churgan, a men's clothier. They've got a picture of Arnold Churgan. There he is. Ah. We've got a picture of Arnold Church. The best shoes ever. Yeah, there was a great uh, column. I think it was uh, it was Brian Brennan interviewed him and wrote a. Oh no, it was Brian Brennan wrote a column about him when he died. When when Arnold Churgan died, a tribute column, 
And uh, it was really nice. And it was just so affectionate. It just said, you know, he, he quoted him saying, I just really like shoes, you know, like he, I, I didn't know him. I, his son was a grade behind me in Hebrew school. If anyone knew him, maybe you can comment on this, but just from the column I read, he just seemed like a nice guy. Uh, Victor Siegerman lived in the same house. I'm getting ahead of myself with this photograph here uh, because from a later occupant who wasn't Jewish, Ben Rapport, which I think must have been Rapport, once again, 19th 17, but I don't know um, who this person was. Isaac Berg had to be Jewish, lived here for a couple of years, 1919 to 1920. Lanny Root, obviously a Jewish name in the late 1930s. I know nothing more about him. Uh, but then we have uh, Shigejiro Inuyi, in Inuyi uh, who's one of uh, five partners in the Nippon Silk Company, which because of anti-Japanese uh, sentiment during the Second World War, renamed itself and became Silk Alina. And uh, probably a lot of a lot mm. of uh, people here remember it. It was on 8th Avenue West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they built up a chain of stores throughout Western Canada, Silk Alina. Um, my, my mom went to school with the daughter of one of the people in the family. So here's the family and staff in, uh, in the store. So again, you know, it's just showing you a little bit more of the ethnic mix of 4th Avenue East, which was never a majority Jewish, but I think Jews were probably as numerous, almost as numerous as, uh, as Anglo-Saxons at one time anyway, but that might be an exaggeration. The next building over, you can only see part of it in the photograph, is, is a hotel. It was the Lincoln Lodge Hotel. I've never been able to find a Jewish connection uh, to it. Went through several names, the Park Hotel for many years, and then the Milton Hotel. When I was a kid, I remember it was still there. It was the Success Hotel. Uh, so if anybody can tell me if there's a Jewish connection, I've gone through some of the owners and never found one. So it just seems so funny. On 4th Avenue East, there's a hotel and there's no Jews involved. Great photograph, though. Uh, then we're up to 314, uh, a house built in 1910. And Abraham Bushakin um, is, and it's a wonderful photograph I got from David Bushakin. He lived there uh, at one point, and I'm sorry I don't have the years when he was there, but his family was into, uh, into the newsagent business, is my understanding. Uh, uh, next door, once again, it's just a hint, Louis Jacobson, but I met a guy named Louis Jacobson who wasn't Jewish. Elias, my sister is on the line. It was the guy who worked for, uh, for that uh, appliance supply company that we dealt with. I can't remember. Anyway, his ancestry was Danish, I think. I just, I just assumed he was Jewish. So you don't, you shouldn't assume. And then on the corner, we've got this longtime guy. He was there. He was here from from the nineteenth century. He he lives here and uh, for many years. He's a grocer in the East End. Guy named David Kerr, and he wasn't Jewish. <laughs> but who lived in the house he owned? Rabbi Smolensky, uh, right on that corner. Uh, so here we have Rabbi Smolensky, and this photograph of him is taken at the time he lived in that corner house on 4th Avenue East. Rabbi Smolensky came to Calgary in uh, 1917 to take over the, uh, to become the new rabbi of the House of Jacob, and he succeeded another rabbi that we'll see um, who also lived on 4th Avenue East. He was my grandfather. Oh, who's speaking? Minnie. Oh, Minnie, yes, yeah, yeah. Did, did you know him, Minnie? You must have. Very well, very, very well. What can you tell us? He was amazing. He believed in all of the Jewish covenants and he had great knowledge and respect for Calgary. He loved it. It was he who put the Hebrew school on a solid footing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And was rabbi for many, many, many years. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, shame. He was, he was living in um, Lower Mount Royal, must have been when you knew him. Afterwards, at the end, he lived in Lower Mount Royal on 19th Avenue. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame. There were, at different times, two different rabbis lived on 19th Avenue, him and another rabbi. I don't know if they were at the same time, though. And both houses are gone. I don't yeah. think so. Baron Hulls was here when he was there. Yeah. But he yeah. was on fourth, uh, about 6th Avenue, southeast. Mm hmm Anyway, wonderful photo, too. Uh, so... Um, then we just keep going further along. And here's the corner where, uh, where Rabbi, uh, um, uh, where, your, where your grandfather lived. Right. But there were uh, a lot of Jews around him. Sorry, what? Many Jewish families on oh, that. Oh, yes. Favorite. That's right. 
Uh, we go back to the other corner. So you see over to the, what you're seeing here to the right, you see 304 uh, 4th Avenue East on the top right. That's, uh, that's where your grandfather lived, uh, Rabbi Smolensky. Now I've highlighted the opposite corner. We're, we're over around the corner on, um, let's see, that's 3rd Street East, I believe. Um, and, uh, and now we have his predecessor, Rabbi Isaac Kleigman, who lived there on that corner in 19, uh, 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 you know, at the time that he was the rabbi of the, um, of the House of Jacob. Now it's very odd. Oh, and you see here, um, I've, I've sort of shown you the spatial relationship. So the, 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 uh, the blue box to the right, you can see it's just across the street from the public market. Um, and it's just a, um, like a space of about a block and a half north of the, um, of the uh, House of Jacob which is highlighted here in a blue box to the left. And this is very odd. It's, um, it, it's labeled as Jewish synagogue um, on the fire insurance map to distinguish it, I suppose, from the Samaritan synagogues in Calgary. Uh, anyway, but if you look back to the right, back to the block that's got the uh, blue box around, uh, around where Rabbi Klegman lived, and you look to the north end of the block, I haven't highlighted it, but that's the house where, um, uh, where Rabbi Smolensky lived. So you can have a little triangle of rabbi's homes and uh and the uh, house of jacob um in, in the 300 east block uh this is and that very corner where uh, rabbi klegman had lived and this is very strange like rabbi klegman he was in calgary he lived we know where he lived we know that he he was the religious leader at the house of jacob and then he even um the jewish historical society sent me a a, a copy of a page from the uh, marriage uh book you know, where all the marriages were recorded for provincial government purposes. And, you know, March 1917, there's a marriage that's officiated by Rabbi Isaac Kleigman. And then the synagogue doesn't have a rabbi for, for two or three months. And then uh, Rabbi, uh, uh, rabbi Smolensky arrives. Yeah. Now, the, we have, there's a burial of an Isaac Kleigman in the Hever Kedisha Cemetery in the middle of March uh, 1917. It has to be the rabbi of the House of Jacob. But the record is silent on him. I've, I've checked the three newspapers, the Herald, the Albertan, and the News Telegram, which was uh, uh, being published at the time. I find no uh, obituary and no, um, uh, no news item about his death. Mm -hmm. And yet he died in Calgary and is buried in Calgary. And he was a rabbi. Wow. Yeah, very odd. Uh, anyway, and here's, here's just sort of an annex to the, that Martin family uh, building. Um, uh, on that corner. Here we have Martin's, Martin's Bakery, a, a later iteration of Martin's Bakery. Kitty corner to the, uh, to the Palliser. Oh, sorry, the, um, not the Palliser, the, the, uh, the Seesaw. Yeah. How can I bring them up? Yeah. And here, this is the parking lot where Rabbi Smolensky's house was. Right. Just across the street from the Harry Hayes building. Uh, now we go to the south side of the street. Hold on, I'll get there. And this will be our last uh, um, uh, thing we talk about today. And this is that entire block that was leveled in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s to make way for the YW, the new YWCA, which is now the old YWCA. Uh, so when I took these photographs uh, this past summer, it shows a pretty derelict looking area, you know. Uh, and there's, a, there's just a, 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 this powerful photograph can't remember the guy's name. He lived on Fifth Avenue East, but he had lived in his house for many years. And they, uh, um, act, um, boy, what's the word? Eminent domain. When they uh, expropriated, they expropriated his house because he lived right in the middle of the block. Not a Jewish guy, and they had to have his property to complete the land assembly to build the YWCA. And he, so his attitude is, "This is my house. You, you got to drag me out of it." And they did. So there's, there's one photograph where he's shaking his fist at the photographer, you know, because he's not moving. And then they have a later photograph where he's being taken away in a stretcher um, out of his house to build uh, the YWCA. But that's all on the Fifth Avenue side. Um, anyway, we see the, um, the, uh, uh, that almost every property, all properties but one on this, on this block where the, uh, the old YWCA is now. Um, had a Jewish connection. And uh, so I'll just quickly go through those and then we've, uh, we've got it covered. Uh, this is the one the furthest east. So you, you see this um, carriages and harnesses at the front and feed and sales stables at the rear at 333. Uh, this here we have, um, it's called Sibley's Hall in 1912. And what we've got here 
is the, um, and Betty Sherwood supplied this, it's the uh, invitation to the wedding of uh, B. Margulis and, uh, and his wife, uh, Sarah Sosinski at Sibley's Hall in 1912. Mm. Uh, it later on becomes Hector Ironworks, which was owned by John Hector, uh, who uh, had come here in, in 1906. Uh, then there's a later series, there's, there's also a series of, of um, uh, livery, uh, dairy um, operations, machine works um, with or without Jewish connections. The next property over is uh, 331, the home of single story dwelling, uh, home of Max Bronstein, a laborer and clerk before the First World War. Wolf Grimberg, once again, I have only names, uh, in, during the First World War. And then we have Frank Tucker living in that house. And I don't know, I, I think he's the same Frank Tucker who had come from Calgary, was a cattle trader. Uh, uh, and um, uh, well, I'm, I'm quite sure of it. Uh, anyway, uh, he, there's, there's a news item of uh, a, an accident on the Center Street Bridge that he was involved in. And I've got the, um, the, uh, the clipping. He lived to 1979. He, he lived at um, Trinity Lodge at the time he died. Uh, anyway, he was, uh, uh, had his, his team and his Democrat on, uh, on the Center Street Bridge. His horses were upset uh, by a motor vehicle and uh, um, went over the, the embankment on the north side of the river. He was hurled out of the vehicle and sustained a broken foot. The Democrat was smashed up, but the horses were not injured. Um, Anyway, then uh, the same house, we, we then have someone named Victor Zudelman or Zagerman. Uh, they're, they're notoriously bad in these sources at rendering Jewish names. Even worse with Chinese names, I've noticed. Then we have that same uh, Sam Elman, who's moved uh, for, to a new place. W. Srocki, I sounds like a name that's been corrupted. Um, uh, now we go next door, 327. Um, this is a single story house. Uh, probably built around, uh, well, uh, it actually could be built earlier. I looked at the, um, the uh, assessment roll as early as 1910. It's owned by John Emerson. Now, there was a John Emerson in Calgary who was the mayor. Um, and uh, um, he, uh, he rented it to the property to a woman named Charles, Mrs. Charles Grassley. So it's possible that the mayor owned this property why it's so interesting to us is it functioned as the Calgary Hebrew School. This is before Rabbi Smolensky came. There were several iterations of the Calgary Hebrew School. This is the 1912 iteration, which, which became defunct in 1914. So this is the last Calgary Hebrew School before mm -hmm. Rabbi Smolensky um, came to town and re-established the Hebrew School, and it has operated ever since. Uh, so the Hebrew School at that house, where you know that they where where the um, uh, YWCA is now. There's a 1912 uh, article from the Calgary Herald describing, you know, the uh, outlining uh, uh, the school and what it does. And it concludes with this paragraph. The importance of the school for Calgary, which has started a university, there was a short-lived university in Calgary, needs no pointing out. All know that since a few years, the Hebrew language has been recognized on par with Latin and Greek by all colleges for only a thorough knowledge of Hebrew is conducive, conducing, I think they mean conducive, to a good understanding of the biblical text. So, I mean, this is boosterism. They're saying, you know, boy, we're such an important city and we have a new university and how lucky we are that there's a Hebrew school and maybe, maybe um, the whole city can benefit from this. Should that school find support by the citizens of Calgary at large, it would be possible to form a special class for Gentile students. The only drawback at present is the lack of suitable premises. It's a little old house on 4th Avenue East. The capacity of the present rooms is already filled up so that there will have to be refused further admissions. Anyway, so that's, that's the location of that Hebrew school. Other Jewish occupants included David Rosenthal, whoever he was, Harry Kruper, and Myers W. Rosen, who lived there for about 20 years, but I know nothing about him other than, other than his name and where he lived. The next one is quite interesting. I don't have a, a blue box around it, but it's in about the middle of the block, 323. It's, it's a, a house that was built in 1885 for Alexander Allen. And this is its second location. Where was the original location? This is the house, by the way. But the photograph isn't taken on 4th Avenue East. It's taken on 8th Avenue West. Uh, this was where the Hudson's Bay is now. So that house, the Allens lived in that house for just a couple of years. Um, and then uh, a fellow named George Alexander bought it. He and his cousin um, redeveloped that, uh, that corner 
8th Avenue and 1st Street Southwest, the Northwest corner, as the Alexander corner. Um, beautiful building. It was uh, um, stood there from 1891 until it was demolished in 1930 to, uh, uh, to make way for an addition to the Hudson's Bay store. The Hudson's Bay store was originally on 7th Avenue. So the Alexander Corner, the Alexanders owned the um, waterworks, municipal waterworks and gas utility. It had its offices here and there were actually water tanks outside on the street, like underground water tanks. Um, but the other thing that was in this building that distinguished it on the main floor was the Masonic uh, Hall. And here we have a photograph of the interior. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's a low resolution image from the Glenbow. But this is the uh, Masonic uh, temple. And this is where the original, uh, the very first uh, recorded um, high holiday services in Calgary took place in 1890, 1894, I believe. Um, uh, Jacob Diamond, who was the first Jewish man to settle permanently in Calgary, was also a Mason. And he convened um, uh, high holiday services at, the, at, at this Masonic hall, on this, which was in the Alexander Corner, which was built on the site. Of the house. Mm -hmm. That chandelier that's in that hall is almost identical to the one that hangs in the house of Jacob today. You're it's right. Identical. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I, I wonder uh, if I have the time to count. I think there should be uh, uh, um, uh, uh, 15, 15 bulbs, but, but that chandelier for some reason looks identical to our current chandelier, which Isn't came from the original house of Jacob, by the way at, at uh, 323 Fifth Avenue, but that chandelier looks identical. It really it does. It's a common form of chandelier. Uh, uh, maybe it's the very same one, I doubt it, but it's identical to the one that we have. Yeah, very interesting. This, this Masonic Hall, I don't know if the hall was there, the building was demolished in 1930. The, the, the present Masonic Hall on 12th Avenue was built about 1928, I think. I would suspect that it was still there until the Masonic Hall moved to 1912. But the Jewish, the Jewish community, having had high holiday services, I don't think that was the only Jewish function in that. Uh, to be honest, I've read of others where there were like Jewish lectures, you know. Um, Sandra, I don't know if you know of any other uh, um, synagogue services that were held at the Masonic Temple. But, you know, who knows? I mean, this predates the House of Jacob by... Um, uh, I don't know, uh, 15 years. Wow. So, you know, I mean, maybe it influenced the, the choice to, to buy a similar uh, chandelier for the synagogue. But you're right, well, now that you mention it, it's, you know, it sure looks like it. No. Uh, oh, and I've got one more good story, I have to tell you. Uh, once we're at 323, we've got Abraham Rabinovitz, a laborer, uh, in the same house later on, Samuel I. Levitt lives there, and then Isaac Tucker, uh, and then John Berkovich. And then we have David Geffen, not the David Geffen, who's the, uh, the movie and uh, music uh, mogul, but Calgary's David Geffen, who had come from Lithuania. Um, he lives in the house in the late 1920s. He, he was killed tragically in a, in a, a crash, a, tr a truck. Uh, his truck hit, a, hit the train, I believe. I've got the, the clipping. Um, in the next slide. Um, he was a um, cattle dealer. So we're, he and his brother Morris were both cattle dealers. I mean, it's a phenomenon. There were many, many Jewish cattle dealers, uh, um, you know, who traded at the, uh, the, the uh, you know, bought cattle and traded them at the, um, uh, uh, at the cattle yards. Um, anyway, uh, David Geffen and uh, a young colleague, uh, let's see what his name was. I can't remember. It was uh, uh, Samuel Morrow. Uh, had gone to Nose Creek to go and pick up a couple of cows that uh, that David had bought, um, and uh, and they're struck and killed um, by the by a CPR train. Um, anyway, the uh, uh, the the Samuel Morrow, who's twenty one, uh, uh, David Geffen was forty one. Uh, Samuel Morrow's brother was Ernest Morrow, who went on to become the mayor of Forest Lawn when Forest Lawn was a town. This is, this is Ernest Morrow many years later. And there's a school in Forest Lawn named for Ernest Morrow. So, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just a slender thread, but uh, just, you know, it's, um, it is a sad realization when I saw that uh, Samuel Morrow was from Forest Lawn and knew immediately there had to be a connection to Mayor Ernest Morrow. Uh, but I'm afraid that's the last good story I have for you. 
Uh, then we just go a little further down the block with a few more names. Nathan Kaufman, confectioner at 319. Uh, we've got Charles Bogdanoff and followed by Victor Ziegerman at 313. Uh, so hopefully in time, you know, we'll get, we'll learn more about these people. Uh, uh, 311, um, once again, Rosa Goldstein, obviously Jewish, David Geffen. Um, and I'll just keep going to see. Here's another address for Rabbi Klegman. Uh, this, this would have been his final home at 309 uh, before he died in 1917, even nearer to the synagogue. And you see the um, Ontario Steam Laundry on the corner there. And it's my understanding that Jewish people would work there. That was owned by um, uh, uh, Nat Christie. Um, anyway, once again, just people with Jewish names. I haven't got a lot of, uh, a lot of detail in a lot of them. Uh, Kachkovsky, Srosky. Uh, oh, and Charles Malkin, this is, this will be our last address. Uh, Charles Malkin owned this property during the First World War. Um, and once again, we've, we've seen Charles Malkin earlier on in 1907. Um, and he's the fellow who had a store. Oh, by the way, Charles Malkin, I've read that his, his store in 8th Avenue East was a Jewish gathering place. People would go there to chew the fat and, and, uh, and have meetings at Charles Malkin's store. Uh, so that pretty much wraps up the Eastern um, three blocks of Jews on 4th Avenue East. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, the better stories are in the, you know, I mean, the, the, the ones that are more complete stories and not list of names will be in the January presentation. So I hope you guys got something out of it. I know I learned more since the first time I did it. Um, and I, I confess it's a work in progress. Uh, Harry. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Harry. So another question. Yeah. Harry, can I say one more thing? Please. Uh, with that Ontario laundry, I recall it had a great big, huge red brick chimney. And if I'm not mistaken, that chimney was relocated to uh, Barclay Square there at Eau Claire. Oh, well that, the chimney that's that's in Eau Claire. If I'm not mistaken. Was, well, that was part of the, um, the, the heating plant for the, uh, for the bus. Carry your laundry. Oh, well, that was the bus barns um, at, at Eau Claire. So it's, mm. you know, I, I have a feeling Okay. Uh, I know I've wrong. seen, yeah, you know, I mean, just like I've seen, I, I don't remember either of those struck. Oh, I mean, I do, I, of course, the, the one that's there, I know. Um, but I'm quite sure that was purpose built for the, because the bus barns, what happened was, I mean, the old streetcar barns were on 2nd Street East. They were, they were just, if you can picture where the, the big four building is um, in the stampede grounds, oh, yeah. immediately south of the big four building, there's a um, parking lot. Uh, that becomes part of the midway uh, during Stampede. And that's where the streetcar barns were. Um, anyway, in, but after the war, they started, they, they made the conversion from streetcars to, uh, to trolley coaches and, and buses. They bought the uh, Eau Claire property, acquired uh, um, three uh, wartime hangars uh, that were used for, for Air Force purposes uh, Air Force training purposes outside of Calgary during the Second World War, dismantled them, brought them to Eau Claire and reassembled them as the bus barns. But they built a new structure, which was a, the like the, the the heating plant and smokestack for the for the bus barns mm -hmm. in about 1946. And I have seen a photograph of the Ontario Laundry with its smokestack. I can't tell you, you know, I mean, it's not in my life experience to, to, to have seen that place or known anything about it, but you're right to, to I mean, I imagine the photographs I've seen and it looks identical to, to the one yeah. that exists in Eau Claire. So maybe it was moved, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what they did, but it was the, it, in, at Eau Claire, its purpose was to heat the, um, uh, the bus barns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you remember the Jewish, any Jewish connection to the Ontario Laundry? I, just, I know there was one, and I, I just, I, I can't think of the specifics that I've read. My mother used to work there. That was one of her jobs <laughs> in the early days. Harry, thank you very much. It was very enlightening. Thank and I, I wish you could have gone further west, because your cousin, Bernice Rolovitz, lived on 4th Avenue. Did she? I didn't yes, know. she did. Yes, she did. Oh. And I lived two blocks away from her. Really? 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. it was a whole community of Jewish people further west. Yeah. I, and that, you know, this is this is the thing I was asked to break it up into into two sections so that I wouldn't have to rush through it as I did the first time. So I just thought I'll do it geographically. I'll go from east to west. So I can't remember the date. It might be January 19th that and, and I promise there will be more stories and fewer lists of names. Um, but I'm going to do the, the western portion. And Sheila, I'll talk to you because I want to. Can I, give, can I give you guys okay. a treat, though? Uh, let me just uh, take off oh, the screen sharing. Um, stop share. Uh, I'm going to run and get something. Okay, just just give me a moment. Uh, this is so complicated. Okay, more complicated than it has to be. All right, just give me a second. Oh, there's, there's Bernice. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Did you get that? Oh, it, it was in her condo when she died. And oh, uh, yeah. oh yes. my Bubsy. goodness. Bubsy Bernice, Bubsy David David Baller. Baller, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. pretty good. Isn't it? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's exciting. She lived, she lived in Scarborough after that, right across the park from that's me. Right. Yeah. Right close to 17th Avenue. Yeah, yeah, right on 17th Avenue. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Harry, thank you very much. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That brings back memories, Asia. Oh. One of the 7 million items I have in my basement. <laughs> I was going to ask if you're going to hang it in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the living room is full. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Very Thank interesting. Thanks, everyone. And I, I mean, I have to say, it's it is all based on research. It's it hasn't completely come together yet, and not on experience. Like talking to people like Mel and you know, and um, um, others who had personal connections to to the people and places on Fourth Avenue. You know, I think that was that was a really welcome welcome thing tonight. Um, and I'll follow up with some of you and make sure that I've got. Got it right, and I still see a um, you know a, another future for for this. I think you know. I mean, as as you can tell from tonight, it hasn't quite come together yet. But there really is a story there. Harry, very good. Can you see the chat. Thanks, Harry. Thanks. Oh, I do see the chat. Yeah, you, you should Harry, read the chat. There's a, there's a question okay. in the chat about whether you're planning to publish the results of your research. Well, what's what's the budget, Sandra? Uh, <laughs> I have no budget. <laughs> uh, I think something somehow, even if you know, there 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 has to be a venue for this, yes. uh, you know, because there's 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 a story to tell here. Uh, so yes, please please expect this to a, a, amount to something, um, you know, even if it's a a, a blog. Uh, hopefully, it'll be something more. Uh, but yes, I'm sorry, I hadn't. Uh, Correction Green Book. Oh, there's a lot in the chat. Should should, it, should do you guys want to take the time now for me to read the chat? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let's yeah. see. Uh, I was born at Mel. Oh yes, fifth and fourth. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Evelyn Scheftel, uh, Louis Gold. Oh, Louis Goldstein later worked in my dad Ben Scheftel's grocery meat and hardware store called Empress Store. Oh, very good. Yeah, he was the one we had. That was in the first block. You right. know, corner property. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Mel, same, uh, Mel was born in the same block as the Cecil Hotel, went to school. Bunny Shinin's son, son was High Shinin. That's the same uh, family that owned the uh, owned that Calgary Public Market. Susan, my great-grandparents had a general store, 425. Oh, uh, what, what were your great-grandparents' names, Susan? Can you, can you add that to the chat? And I'm going to take a quick uh, screenshot here. So I've got the chat. It was 8th Avenue, though. Oh, it was 8th Avenue. Yeah. Okay. Also good, worth knowing. Uh, are you, okay. Just, are you taking information for other avenues? Uh, oh, anything's good. Um, I uh, I'd certainly want to uh, uh, want to follow up on any of this. Uh, hold on a moment. I'm just because I don't know how to find the chat after the program ends. So I'm just quickly going to take a couple of screenshots. I hope you guys don't mind, uh, and then get back to to whatever questions there are. Um, oops, hold on. Harry, you can just highlight it and copy and paste it too. 
Oh, okay. Oh, you're right. Okay, I'll do that quickly. Okay, just give me a second here. If you right click, you can select all. Uh, I will do that. Thanks, Lauren. Hold on a second. You're welcome. Sorry to make you guys wait for me to do this. Um, uh, let me just send it to myself. Uh, there we go. Okay, got it. All right. Um, uh, Charles Malkin is my great grandfather. Steve, Stephen Nagler is is here. Steve, uh, Stephen Nagler, very good. Uh, are you still here, Stephen? Anyway, excellent. You know, Charles Malkin certainly figures highly in early Calgary's history. Uh, the bagel was Kitty Corner. Bakery was Kitty Corner from the Cecil. We saw a photograph of that. But we bought pumpernickel bread at Martin's Bakery. Was the H. Fradkin mentioned on a slide earlier related to Louis Fradkin, father perhaps? I will find that out, Stephen. Um, there is my house. There is my house, Mel. Oh, that must be when I was showing the slide of yeah, the, uh, yeah. of, the uh, of the Cecil Hotel with the with the house right in the background. It's a great photograph, uh, but I, I want to see the one that's got Mel as a baby with his mother. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the doors were men's and women's escorts. Um, right. That's right. Uh, and uh, and my sister is enjoying my uh, enjoying the comments. Uh, thanks, Elias. Uh, Leo bought the hotel on her about nineteen. Hi, Elias. Used to live across the street from you, Evelyn. I did cross the street. Hi. Yeah. Hi, honey. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm here. You'll have your dog? Oh, you until last dog. summer. Okay. Harry, are you going to talk about Fifth Avenue? I think uh, the Shapiro uh, confectionery uh, was there, and Phil Shapiro bought quite a bit of Fifth Avenue, Fifth, the, like, yeah, close to his, that whole block. Evelyn, I'll contact you and I'll come back. Please let me come back and do a Fifth Avenue talk. Okay. And I'll make sure I got it all together before I, uh, uh, before I, I, I well, ask you to have me. Right yes. Door, right next door to my grandparents was the Stein, um, Norm Steinberg's family. Right next door. Norm it was on Steinberg, his parents were right next door to my grandparents and around the corner was the Fabers and the Hashmans. Oh. There was a whole bunch of them and a whole group there and a grocery store owned by Shrelovich. Which Shrelovich? I don't know which. I thought oh. her name was Pearl. Oh, hold on. Yes, on foot. Yes, that's right. On 4th Avenue. Yeah, Pearl's. This is this is like uh, Center Street and 4th Avenue? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay, that's yeah, yeah. It's yeah. There. It full of Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah. Right across from my Zeta down the street on the other side was Lawrence's, and they were Jewish too. Evelyn, uh, sorry, Minnie, I'll certainly contact you before January when I uh, when I give the second half. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure remember. I got it right before uh, before coming on. We'll try and remember. Uh, I'll make a note right Wait. now, and then it'll happen. Hi, Pickles the dog. <laughs> Okay, I, I better go. Okay, bye, Harry. This was so good. It Thank was you so it. much. It was wonderful. Fourth Avenue. Okay, I've made mm -hmm. notes on who I have to follow up with. Um, thank you, Harry. I don't. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Thanks to the Jewish Histor Historical Society and to. Uh, Maxine Fishbein and Chazak for putting this together. And of course, yeah. Harry, it was like a, a bit of an archaeological dig in the middle of it too. We kept on learning. Yeah. In the middle of it. Yeah, half the, yeah. yeah which is yeah. a lot of the fun. And uh, it's so nice to have, uh, get more information from the people in the room. So looking forward to the 19th of January. See you yes. all then. I am too. Thanks very much, Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yashikoa. Thank you. Good night. Okay, I'm going to be closing the room. Thanks, everyone. Bye.